Hi all, welcome to the second session um, on permutations, combinations and probability. So in the last video we looked at permutations and combinations and now today we're going to move on and have a look at probability which is is indeed a bigger section um, than permutations and combinations. Um, it can be a big section, a relatively big section on paper two. You can get a couple of short questions, you can get a long question. It can be combined in with a few different chapters. So it is an important one for you to practice and get your head around. It is a, a way of thinking um, and it is the chance of something happening. So what is probability? Well, probability involves the studies of the laws of chance. It is a measure of the chance or the likelihood of something happening. Some words that are often used when you flip a coin, when you throw a dice, so on and so forth. Each of those events or operations or experiments is called a trial. Uh, what happens from that trial is called an outcome. And whichever outcome you are interested in is called an event. In other words, an event is the set of successful outcomes. Okay, for example, if you throw the die and you're interested in the probability of throwing an even number, then the even number is 2, 4 and 6. They're the three even numbers you can get if you throw that die and they are what we consider as the successful outcomes. Typical uh, maths notation that's used in probability, E is an event, then P with E in brackets is the probability of E occurring. So you will, you will often see P of E written down. Okay, very important definition. The probability of E occurring is the number of successful outcomes over the total number of possible outcomes. So if we go back up to that uh, example that was given previously of you throwing a die and you would like an even number, then the number of successful outcomes was 3, 2, 4 and 6. The total number of possible outcomes is the number 6. So you, from that die you could have thrown 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 or 6. So the probability of getting an even number is 3 over 6. And probability you can represent as a fraction, as a decimal, as a percentage. It's totally up to you, but perfectly okay to leave it as a fraction. It's often left as a fraction. Something really important to always remember with probability is that it has to be a number between 0 and 1. A probability of zero means that the event is impossible. It, it will never occur. The probability of one means it's a certainty. It will for sure occur. And a 50-50 chance, such as we had above here with getting an even number of a die, means you're as likely to get a successful outcome as an unsuccessful one. Okay, and then you'll see different probability scales um, in different textbooks. It depends how granulated the scale needs to be, but it will be everything from impossible, um, which is a probability of zero, up to certainty, which is a probability of one. Really useful to you for you to remember when you're doing probability, because if after you do a prob probability calculation, and you get a number that is not between 0 and 1, you have made an error somewhere or other. So it can be quite good, and I'll come back to this point again in a while about uh, where you need to watch out for getting a probability greater than 1. Okay, I'm going to skip the top of it. You can read it if you wish. You can pause and read at any stage if you wish. But I'm going to go on to the probability of an event not happening. Okay, probability of an event has to or has to add up to one. So in other words, the probability of getting that even number and the probability of not getting that even number when I threw that die previously had to add up to one. So if you think about it, I had three over six as the probability of getting an even number. I have also three over six being the probability of not getting an even number or getting an odd number, whichever way you look at it. And three over six plus three over six will always equal one. 
Okay, so probabilities always had a, have to add up to one. And it depends on how many different possible outcomes you have from the trial as to how many little probabilities you're adding here together to give you one. For example, if you throw a dice, well, that has six possible um, outcomes, the number one, two, three, four, five, or six. So each of those um, outcomes has a probability of one over six. And when you add all six outcomes together, you will get one. Really handy then when you're given a probability. So if I told you the probability of getting, of, of having rain tomorrow was two thirds, then you would straight away know then that the probability of not having rain is one third. You can go one minus the two thirds, which is the probability of rain, to leave you one third being the probability of not raining. The probability of not E, okay, so the probability of an event not happening is often written as P of E dash, and that comes from sets, sets notation. So that's the complementary. So probability of E dash or the probability of E, e bar or e, ha, e, e bar. So not E. It is important not to count an outcome twice in an event when calculating probabilities. And again, I'll come back to that again. In questions on probability, objects that are identical are treated as different objects. So what do I mean by that? Well, if I come up here to this example where we have um, black balls in a bag, each of these black balls are individually treated as a different object. So there appears to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven black balls in that bag. So the probability of drawing each black ball is one over seven. Okay. Well, actually, there's three white balls again, so the probability of drawing a black ball is 1 over 10. So that's what I mean by objects that are identical are treated as different objects. The phrase drawn at random, you will see that in a lot of questions, means each object is equally likely to be picked. Okay, so if it's a random draw, um, you have an equal chance of picking out anything at all out of whatever you're picking out of. Unbiased means it's fair. Biased means it's unfair in some way. Okay, let's have a look at this example down the bottom, example one. So bag contains eight red, three blue and 13 yellow discs. A disc is sel selected at random from the bag. What is the probability that the disc selected is red? Well, the first thing you need to know is how many discs are in that bag. So you add 8 and 3 and 13 and it will give you 24 discs in that bag. So therefore, the probability of choosing a red disc, well, there's 8 of them in the bag. So you have 8 chances out of the 24 in the bag. So the probability is 8 over 24. And you can simplify that if you wish to 1 over 3. If you can't do it in your head, put 8 over 24 into the calculator using the fraction button and hit, hit, and hit equals, and it will simplify it for you. Saying that, your answer is not wrong if you leave it as 8 over 24. What's the probability of blue? Well, you only have 3 blue, so you have 3 chances out of the 24 of it being blue. Of being yellow, well, you have 13 chances out of the 24 of it being yellow so 13 out of 24 and then not yellow well you can go 1 minus 13 out of 24 and that's how you get non not yellow or you can add the 8 and 3 to give you 11 out of 24 chances of it not being yellow as here okay so there's a couple of ways of doing um, not yellow Okay, the other thing you will need to know for probability um, is your deck of cards. Okay, and if you don't have one, I suggest you get one and you play a card game or two over the next couple of weeks while we're on lockdown and you become familiar with um, a deck of cards. It has four suits, clubs, which are black, diamonds, which are red, hearts, which are red and spades, which are black. Each suit consists of 13 cards 
they all have the numbers 2 to 10, Jack, Queen, King and Ace and sometimes Ace is counted as a 1. The Jack, Queen and King are called picture cards and therefore the total number of outcomes if you pick one card from a deck of cards is 52. There's 52 cards. The reason why you need to know that is that often they ask probability questions on a deck of cards. Okay, and it comes to probably comes from poker and your odds of winning in poker and so on and so forth. A card is drawn at random from a normal pack of cards. What's the probability that it's an ace? Well, there's an ace in clubs, an ace in diamonds, an ace in in hearts and an ace in spades. So four of the cards are aces. So four over 52 is a probability of choosing an ace or simplified to give you one out of 13. The probability of a spade, like it said up here, there's 13 cards belonging to each of the suits. So there's 13 spades, so 13 over 52 or a quarter. The probability of a black card, well half the deck is black, all of the clubs and all of the spades. So 26 out of 52 are black cards. So the probability is 50% or a half of getting a black card. Odd numbered. Okay, so think about that, not strictly um, half, and that's because of the picture cards. So if you think about the odd numbers, we have three, we have five, we have seven, and we have nine. Now, that would be correct. If you also counted the ace as one, that would also be correct. So if in this particular question, you could have um, four odd numbers in each suit or equally correct because it comes down to interpretation would be five odd numbers in each suit. Okay so then you have four suits so you have either four fours or 16 over 52 if you go with four odd numbers or five by four suits which is 20 over 52 if you count the ace as one. Okay, so that's just probability and more or less like an introduction to it. So it's really important. The first formula you have to remember is the probability of an event is the number of successful outcomes over the total number of outcomes. You have to remember that. You have to remember that all probability lies between 0 and 1. And the probability of an event not happening is 1 minus the probability of it happening. So three really important formulas on that page. Okay, so conditional probability, and I'll come back to this in, in a few pages time in, in more detail, but conditional probability means uh, there's a condition attached. So in other words, you have some prior knowledge or you have some extra condition about the outcome. And what this normally does is reduce the size of the span sample space or reduce the total number of outcomes. Okay, because you know something already. Okay, and it's telling you to consider parts four and five of the next example. So let's have a look at this one. In a class, there are 21 boys and 15 girls. Three boys and five, gla five girls wear glasses. A pupil is picked at random from the class. What is the probability that the pupil is a boy? Well, the first thing I have to figure out is how many people are in the class. Well, there's 21 and 15, which is 21, 31, 36 pupils in the class. What is the probability that it's a boy? Well, it's 21 out of the 36. Okay. What is the probability that the pupil wears glasses? Well, I have three boys and five girls wearing glasses, so eight out of the 36 wears glasses. What is the probability that the pupil is a boy who wears glasses? Well, only three of the pupils who wear glasses is a boy. So three out of 36 is the chance of it being a boy who wears glasses over the total number of pupils in the class. Now a girl is picked at random from the class. So now you can say your sample space is just the 15 girls okay 
So this is where conditional probability comes into it. You're now looking at just the subset of the class, which is the girls. So 15 is now my sample space. So what's the probability that she wears glasses? Well, it's 5 over 15 um, is the probability that given it was a girl that was picked, that she wears glasses. Now, part 5, a pupil wearing glasses is picked at random from the class. OK, so now your sample space has been reduced down to 8. So you have picked a pupil wearing glasses. So it wasn't a randomly chosen student. It was a pupil wearing glasses was picked. So it's just these eight um, students here that we're looking at. Now, what is the probability that it's a boy then? Well, it's three out of those eight. Um, if you're a bit overwhelmed at this stage of probability, um, what I would tell you is to practice all of these exercises that I'm about to give you and on WhatsApp send me a message, it can be a private message, to check your answers. Okay, Probability is a logical way of thinking. It is just simply not a common sense approach if I could call it that it is logically and statistically what is the chance of it happening okay and once you get your head around that and into the way of thinking which is just logical chance of it happening um, a little bit of the mystery falls out of this chapter but that only comes with a little bit of training your brain into how to think um, by chance. Okay, and it says we will meet more conditional probability later. So like I said, we'll be coming back to that in a few pages. Okay, now much more so on your course is when you combine two events. So there are many situations where we have to consider two outcomes. In these situations, all the possible outcomes for the sample space can be listed in a sample space diagram. Okay, and there's a couple of sample space diagrams. Uh, two of the most common are a two-way table, which is drawn here. The other one is a tree diagram. Okay, and both of which I'm going to do with you at some stage over the next week. So let's have a look at the two-way table they have here first. Um, I personally wouldn't use it that often. I'm much more of a tree diagram person. However, some people prefer these, so you have to figure out again which suits your, your style of learning. So two fair-sided dice, one red and the other blue, are thrown. What is the probability of getting two equal scores or the scores adding up to 10? Now, of course, you could write down all the different uh, permutations of throwing those dice and what they add up to. OK, and then figure it out. Um, the two-way table is just an arranged way of doing that. So you take your blue dice and you write out all of your out outcomes, 1 to 6. You could write them downwards, 1 to 6 either. Your red dice here, 1 to 6 on the bottom. Of course, that could also be on the top. It doesn't really matter. OK, so when I see 1, 1 here and a dot here, that means I've thrown 1 on the red dice and I've thrown 1 on the blue dice. This location here, I've thrown 2 on the red dice one on the blue dice. Over here, for example, I've thrown six on the red dice, I've thrown two on the blue dice. So this is why it's called a two-way table. It gives you all of the different options, every single one of them that could occur from rolling those two dice. And once you lay this out, then it becomes very easy to figure out the probability of whatever you've been asked for. So we're asked in this case, what is the probability of getting two equal scores? Well, They've placed a dot in each of the locations where the uh, number on the two dice are the same. And then in addition, or in probability, that means add the probabilities. Let me come back to that again. The scores add up to 10. So when we're adding up to 10 on a dice, we have 6 and 4, which is here. Or, of course, 4 and 6, which is here. 
there's no other way of adding up to 10, there's no 7 on a dice, so on and so forth. So that is the only way I can do it. And then just count the dots. So I have 6, 7, 8. So I have 8 is the successful outcomes over 36. 6 sixes, or just count the boxes. 6, 36 is my total number of possible outcomes. So 8 over 36, which is um, 2 over 9. Really important here, um, 5, 5 is not counted twice. Okay, So even though that is the same number on each die, and it also adds up to 10, we only count it once. Okay, And again, I'll come back to that again about not double counting. Okay, let's try one. Let's see. Let's try question four. A fair spinner has eight sides as shown. The sides are labeled A, B, A, B, B, C, 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 and F. The spinner is spun once. What is the probability that the spinner lands on A? Okay, well, it has eight sides. It has just one A. So the probability that it lands on A is 1 over 8. What is the probability of B? Well, how many successful outcomes could I have? Well, I could have 2. I have this B and this B. So it's 2 over 8 or a quarter. What's the probability that it lands on C? Well, I have 1, 2, 3, 4 possible outcomes here that are successful. So it's 4 over 8, which is a half. Okay, by replacing the letters A and F on the spinner, describe how to make the fair spinner behave like a fair coin. Well, a fair coin has got heads or tails, so you have equal chance of landing on heads or tails. So the only way I could make this a fair spinner is to have the same amount of each letter on the spinner. So if I can replace A and F, then I would replace them with Bs, so that I have four B's on that spinner and then four C's. And then you have a 50-50 chance of getting a B or a C. So that is it behaving then like a fair coin. Okay. There's more there. You are welcome to try any of these. So like I said, if this stuff is bothering you, try as many of them as you can and I guarantee you will get in on it. You may not ever like it but you will get in on the way of thinking and send me the answers. Okay. Okay, estimating probability then from experiments. Um, okay, so maybe up front you don't know the probability of something happening and maybe it would require an experiment to figure out the probability of something. Or you want to test the theory that the probability of an event is what's stated in theory. Um, for either of these, you would need to run an experiment where you carry out uh, an event multiple times and you tally whatever the outcome is. So, Elena suspects that a six-sided die is biased. In an experiment, she throws the die 300 times. She records the results after 60, 120, 180, 240 and 300 throws. Her results are shown in the following tables. Okay, after 60 throws, she has got 8 number 1s, 11 number 2s, 13 number 3s, 11 number 4s, 7 number 5s, 10 number sixes. So when I look at that line here, I think mm, maybe it's a little bit biased. I don't have as many ones and fives. Okay, and I seem to have a lot of threes. Right, let's have a look at it after 120 throws. I have 19 number ones, 23 number twos, 25 number threes, 19 number 4s, 15 number 5s, 19 number 6s. OK, 
okay after that I'm wondering number three is it a little bit higher than the rest let's have a look after 180 throws 31 32 35 27 25 30 after 240 I have 40 44 44 36 36 and 40 and then after 300 throws I have 50 53 52 45 51 49 okay the more throws that you throw or the more more times you do the experiment the more faith you have in your results okay and what tends to happen when you do a lot of throws is that the actual um, probability that you get from running the experiment um, I suppose goes towards the theoretical probability or it approaches the theoretical probability so the theoretical probability of a six-sided die is 1 over 6 or in decimal 0 0.1667 okay let's have a look at the relative um, frequency or the relative probability that Elena got for each of her throws if it did it anywhere okay so it's just looking at the number of threes here Okay, so you've got 13 over 60, 25 over 120, 35 over 180, 44 over 2, 40, and 52 over 300. So she's getting 0 0.2167, 0 0.20, 0 0.19, 0 0.18, and 0 0.17. When Elena compares her expected probability, she could reasonably conclude that the die is fair. Okay. The values 13 over 60 and so on and so forth are called the relative frequencies. The more throws she made, the more accurate the relative frequencies. So what I would do is I would work out 50 over 300, 53 over 300, 52 over 300, 45 over 300, 51 over 300 and 49 over 300. And see how close they are to my 1 sixth or my 0 0.1667. Okay, and you'll find actually that they are very close. And from that, you can then conclude that this is actually a fair die. Okay, the differences that you see up here. So, for example, if you throw that um, 60 times, it, theoretically, you would expect to get 10 times to land on one. 10 times on 2, 10 times on 3, 10 times on 4, 10 times on 5, 10 times on 6. Okay, I just got that from 60 divided by 6. So that's theoretically how many times each number you would expect to get. Okay, of course, in real life, in practice, you're not going to get 10 for each number, um, and that's called experimental error. Okay, so. The relative frequency of an event in an experiment is given by the number of successful trials over the total number of trials. Okay, so not really that different to probability um, at all, really. It's the number of successes again over the number of trials. So when we were getting the probability of a three being thrown, it was this 52, which was the number of successful threes over 300, the number of trials. Okay, um, and then expected value or the expected number of outcomes is calculated as follows. Um, the relative frequency multiplied by the number of trials or the probability of an event by the number of trials. So what do I mean by that? Well, the expected number of threes I would have expected for 300 throws is a sixth. So that's the probability of my event by 300. So I would have expected um, 50 threes to come out in the same way as I expected 10 up here. So that is the expected number of outcomes. Okay, how would they ask this in an exam? We'll have a look at this example one. 
Elena throws her fair-sided die a total of 1,200 times. Find the expected number of times three would occur. Well, if the die was fair and it said a fair six-sided die, the probability of scoring a three would be one over six. So the expected number of threes is a sixth of 1,200, which is 200 times you would expect to see um, the number three coming up. Okay. Um, it doesn't have to be a fair die or a fair spinner for you to be able to calculate the probabilities. If it is not um, fair or it is biased, you have to know the probability of each number coming up. So in this one, this spinner is biased. The probability that a spinner will land on each number, 1 to 5, is given in the probability distribution table below. So you have five possible outcomes, one, two, three, four, five. In all cases, probability must add up to one. So therefore, if the probability of getting a one is 0 0.25, the probability of getting a two is 0 0.2, the probability of getting a three is 0 0.25, the probability of getting a four is 0 0.15, then the remainder from one must be the probability of getting a five. So add up. 0 0.25, 0 0.2, 0 0.25, 0 0.15, and you get 0 0.85. Subtract that from 1, so therefore the probability of getting a 5 is 0 0.15. Okay, so what if the spinner is spun 200 times, how many 5s would you expect? Well, I would expect 0 0.15 times 200, so 30 times I would expect to see the number 30 arise. No. Uh, 30 is the number of times I would expect to see the number 5 arise. Okay, cool. Okay, let's have a look at... Let's have a look at question six, only look that it looks a little bit oddball. The probability that a biased spinner will land on each of the numbers one to five is given in the probability distribution table. Hence, calculate the value of W. How many W's have I? I have three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, and all probability adds up to one. So each W then is equal to 0 0.1 or 10%, whichever you prefer. So the val the probability of 1 occurring is 0 0.3, the probability of 2 occurring is 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0 0.3 and 0 0.1. All probability has to add to 1. And to find the probability that on one spin the result will be a number less than 3, well I have 0 0.3 here, 0 0.2 here, so 0 0.5, it's less than 3. If the spinner is spun 800 times, calculate the number of times it will show the number 4. Well, it's 0 0.3 times 800. Just cal get my calculator. 0 0.3 times 800. So 240 times. How, what's the probability that it'll be an odd number? Well, I have 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.5 of 800, so 400 times. Okay, so feel free to do any of those that you wish, okay, and depending on how much you are okay or not okay with probability. Okay. Right, so let's move on to combined events, okay, and this is where I'm going to come back to double counting again. Um, so if you remember what I'm talking about there, I'm talking about the the sa the sample space, the two-way table that we did back here, where we didn't count five five twice. Okay. So if A and B are two different events of the same experiment, then the probability that the two events A and B can happen is given by. So this is the probability of A or B occurring is a probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A 
and be occurring. Okay. Okay, so let's have a look at that one. So the probability of A or B occurring is the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. Okay, this is called the OR rule of probability super important okay and when it's the OR rule you add the probabilities okay I'm going to flip to sets notation um, because it might help for some people some people prefer to think of probability as sets it helps them okay so the probability of A or B which means you don't mind if it comes out of um, if it comes out of set A or set B. So in set notation, that's the probability of A union B. So it's all of them. You're not fussy. Okay. So that is the probability of A plus the probability of B. Okay. Now, plus the overlap in the middle Okay, why? Because I have counted that area over there when I was counting my A set and I counted it again when I counted my B set. Okay, so when I was counting set A, I counted that intersection there. When I was counting my set B, I again counted the intersection. So I have counted it twice. So if you think back to that two-way table we did, that was like me counting the five and five as a set of the, where the number is the same and counting it when it added up to 10. Okay, so that is why then you need to subtract off just one of those overlap areas because you've counted them twice. You've counted them as part of A and as part of B. Okay, so remember I said probability always has to be between zero and one. Okay, when you are doing some sums, in many cases, Watch out for when you get the probability of A and B in this type of a scenario and you get a value that's actually greater than 1. Okay, What has happened in those cases, not always, but in a lot of cases, is you have just forgotten or you've double counted. Okay, So make sure you subtract the minus uh, P of A intersection B and that should take your probability back down below 1 again. So look out for this when you're doing these type of questions. Okay. So events A and B are said to be mutually exclusive. Okay, very important words. What are mutually exclusive events? Mutually exclusive events are events that cannot occur at the same time. Okay, if events cannot occur at the same time, then this part here is equal to zero. So for mutually exclusive events, the probability of A or B occurring is simply the probability of A plus the probability of B. Mutually exclusive 
events. Okay, and that is how you prove that two events are mutually exclusive. You prove that there's no overlap between them. Okay, so notes. The probability of not A is the probability of A dash. And therefore, the probability of A and the probability of not A is equal to 1. Nothing new about that. Two events A and B are said to be exhaustive if together they include every possible outcome in the sample space. So in other words, flipping a coin, heads or tails, heads is event A, tails is event B, then in that case, those two events, heads and tails, are exhaustive. In other words, I have covered every possible outcome with just heads or tails. Okay, and in that case, heads and tails will add up to one. Okay, so now, what type of questions do they ask on this stuff? Well, A and B are two events, such as the probability of A union B is equal to 9 tenths, the probability of A is equal to 7 tenths, and the probability of A intersection B is equal to 3 tenths. Okay, so 3 twentieths, sorry. So in this case, uh, these events don't appear to be mutually exclusive because I see an intersection piece in it. Okay, so how would I do this now? Okay, so A and B are two events. We have the probability of A union B being equal to 9 tenths. We have the probability of A being equal to 7 tenths. And we have the probability of A intersection B being equal to 3 twentieths. Okay. Okay. So again, another formula that you need to remember. Okay, that is your standard, um, I suppose your standard or formula for probability. And then you just put the values where the values should be. So 9 tenths is equal to 7 tenths plus the probability of B minus 3 twentieths. Okay, so therefore 9 tenths minus 7 tenths plus 3 over 20 must be the probability of B. And then bang that into your calculator. And I'm getting the probability of B being equal to 7 twentieths. Okay. Okay, so that's the probability of B. The next part asks you for the probability of not B. Well, that's easy enough. It's 1 minus the probability of B. Okay. And then I have the probability of A union B complement. Okay, well again, not A union B, well I know that's 9 tenths, so it has to be a tenth. So if I was drawing diagrams for probability, and in many cases you might be told to represent as a Venn diagram, he's A, he's B. Um, if A union B is 9 tenths, then this 1 tenths must be on the outside. Okay. The intersection is 3 over 20. And then on your calculator, then the probability of A, so this has to be 7 tenths minus 3 twentieths. So that's 14 over 20 if I get a common denominator, minus 3 twentieths. So I'm getting 11 twentieths to go there. And then B. What did I get for the probability of B? I got 7 twentieths minus the 3 twentieths on the inside, which is 4 over 20, which 
which is the fifth. Okay, so that's represented it on a Venn diagram if you're still west. Okay. So let's have a look at example two. An unbiased 20-sided coin, numbers 1 to 20, is thrown. What is the probability of obtaining a number divisible by 4 or 5? Are these events mutually exclusive? Okay, let me do this one. Okay, so an unbiased 20-sided coin. Okay, it's numbers 1 to 20. What is the probability of obtaining a number divisible by 4 or 5? So divisible by 4. So that's 4, 8, 12, 16 and 20. Divisible by 5. 5, 10, 15, 20. Okay. What is the probability of obtaining a number divisible by 4 or 5? Okay, well, divisible by 4. I'll say the probability of that happening is 5 over 20. Probability of di divisible by 5, I have 4 chances out of the 20. And this is where I'm getting my 20 chances. So 4 or 5 then is 4, 5 over 20, or is a plus 4 over 20. Is there any number I have counted twice? Yes. So I have to subtract off one of those events, and the probability of it is 1 over 20. So I am getting 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, minus 1. So I'm getting 8 over 20 or 4, 8, 2 over 5. Okay, if you don't like the minus too much or you want to double check your answer, then just go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So the 5 on the top that's divisible by 4 and the 3 new ones divisible by 5. Don't count the 20 because you've accounted already. Um, when you did divisible by 4. So a bit like factors, we don't repeat them. So 8 chances out of the 20, or 2 out of 5. Okay, are the events mutually exclusive? Well, the answer is no. Um, because the number 20 is common to both events. Or you could say uh, both events can have or can produce an outcome of 20. Okay, or you can say there's overlap or any way that you could have said, so you can do it like this either say no because the probability of A union B is not equal to zero. So you can do it in maths language if you wish, you can do it any way you want. But basically they are just looking for the fact that you know because that overlap was not equal to zero, the events are not mutually exclusive. Okay, and there's another example there, which I'll leave you to read if you so wish. Okay, so ones I want you to do on this page, I'm going to start assigning you work from here on in now because the easier stuff is, is over. Um, I'd like you to do question 8 for me here on page 289, and I'd like you to do question 13. Okay, so pause the video, do them, send me the answer to check. And on this page, I want you to do question 21. Okay, 
So that's mutually exclusive events. The next section I want to do is, is to do conditional probability, but this time do it in, in more detail. So we introduced it a few pages ago. Now let's do it in more detail. Suppose that you're considering two related events, A and B, and we know that B has already occurred. Okay, so we have prior knowledge, or we're not approaching this blind, we already know some information about the events. Okay, when you know some information about the events, it may influence the probability of A occurring, or it may not, but it may. In other words, and I'm going to keep coming back to COVID-19 as I do stats and probability for you because um, it's current, it's topical and it's all over the place. Um, if you knew that your parent had contracted the virus, does that affect the probability of you getting the virus? Well, yes, of course it does. And that is conditional probability. Something has happened and that may influence the probability of A occurring, in my example, of you contracting COVID. Okay, now an example where conditional probability doesn't influence it. So in other words, if I say to you, we have no weather forecasters, if I says to you, it rained last Monday, therefore, what is the probability that it will rain tomorrow? Well, in that particular case, even though you knew that it rained last Monday, that will not influence the probability of it raining tomorrow. Okay, so sometimes prior knowledge helps us or influences our probability. and Sometimes it just doesn't. Okay. For example, if you randomly selected a card from a pack of 52, then the probability that the card selected is a spade is 13 over 52, which is a quarter. However, if you were told that the card selected was black, then this increases the probability 13 over 26. So in other words, if your prior knowledge was that the card chosen was a black one, then now you know that your sample space has been reduced down to 26. There's only 26 cards in the deck of cards. Okay, now what is the probability that you have a spade? Well, you have 13 chances out of those 26, which is a half. If A and B are two events, then the probability of A, given that B has already occurred, is written as the probability of A slash B. The probability of A given B. This is known as conditional probability, and this is what it looks like in a Venn diagram. So given B has occurred means I am only now looking at um, set B. Okay, now what is the probability of A occurring? It's just the piece in green. Okay, so let me say that again. Conditional probability. What is the probability of A given B has already occurred? means I am now only looking at set B. B has occurred. Okay, so I don't even see this white area out here. It is literally just set B. Okay, so now what is the probability of A occurring? Well, that is just the overlap. That is the only part of set A that resides within set B. So that is why the formula for conditional probability is the overlap the probability of A intersecting with B over given that B has occurred. Okay, this is the next very, very important formula that you have to know, you have to take down. Okay. Just looking here. and I think it's okay. Okay, so let's go through these examples. Sometimes the form is good, sometimes we can figure it out in our head. Example one, I think you can figure it out in your head. When a fair-sided die was thrown, the score was an odd number. Okay, so what's my sample space now? Well, there's only three odd numbers on a die, one, three, and five. What's the probability that the score was a prime number? 
Well, out of those three numbers, which are prime? Well, one is not prime because it has only one factor. So the only two prime numbers are three and five. Okay, so two out of those three um, is the probability that it will be a prime number given that the score was odd. So that's two out of three. Using the formula, what is the probability that it's a prime number given that it was an odd number? So the probability that it was prime and odd okay, is two out of six. The probability that it was odd was three chances out of six. And that's two out of three. Okay, example two. A maths teacher gives her class two tests 24% of the class passed both tests and 40% of the class passed the first test. What percentage of those who passed the first test also passed the second test? Okay, and it takes again a tiny bit of practice to get used of how to write this first bit. The probability of what given what to make sure that you have it in the right order. Okay. So you know that 40% of the class passed the first test. Okay, so that's the piece of information you have. So that's what you have been given. That is your conditional knowledge. So that bit goes second. So go back to the question then, what percentage of those who passed the first test also passed the second? So what is the probability that they passed the second test given that they had passed the first? What is the probability of those who passed both the intersection, which is 24% or 0 0.24 or 24 over 100, over 40%, which is those who passed the bottom, which is 0 0.6. Okay, so that is how you do it using the formula. So in that particular case, it is much harder to work it out in your head. Um, it is actually much easier in that particular case to use the formula. And that's why you have to know the formula, to be honest. Okay, so the bottom one now. A and B are two events such that the probability of A given B is 0.4, the probability of A is 0.2, and the probability of B is 0.25. Find the probability of A intersection B and find the probability of A union B. So I'm going to do this one for you because this is um, a little bit harder. Okay, two events, A and B are two events such that the probability of A given B has occurred is 0.4. We know that the probability of A is 0.2 and we know that the probability of B is 0.25. Okay, so there are the three pieces of information that we have. Our first question is looking for the probability of A intersection B. Okay, well when I see conditional probability, the first thing I'm going to write down is that particular form, formula, and I'm going to see, well, what information can I get from that? So that particular formula, the second one always goes in the bottom, okay, and the overlap goes on the top. Okay, so regardless of what I got asked here, I was going to write down this formula to see what information I could get from it. Okay, and it just works out that I am actually going to solve it using this. Okay, so let's bring up the probability of B that's down the bottom, multiply by the probability of A given B is going to give me that intersection. Okay, so probability of B is 0.25, the probability of A given B is 0.4. And when I multiply them together, I get 0 0.1 is the probability of A intersection B. Okay. Now the second one, 
as for the probability of A union B. Okay, and this is where you have to know your probability formulas very well. And you're running down through them in your head to see which ones could you use. Okay, so the probability of A plus the probability of B minus that overlap that I just got. So I'm going to get the probability of A union B to be 0 0.45 minus that 0 0.35. Okay, and that is why it is so vitally important that you know all of your formulas and which ones are there. There isn't an awful amount of them, they do overlap. Um, and hopefully I'll show you that now in a couple of pages. Um, but they are confusing until you, again, until you get used to them. Okay, what will we do on this page? Question two. At a school, 24% of students play soccer and Gaelic football and 30% of the students play soccer. What is the probability the students play Gaelic football given that they play soccer. Okay, let's do this one. Okay, so this is question two, page 293. Okay, at a school, 24% play soccer and Gaelic. So let's call S soccer, let's call G Gaelic. Okay, so if they play soccer and Gaelic, that is the probability of S intersecting with G. Okay, you can call them anything you want. 30% play soccer, so 0 0.3 play soccer. Okay. So what is the probability that a student plays given football, Gaelic football given that? Then you have to know given that is conditional probability. Given that they play soccer. Given that they play soccer. What is the probability that they play Gaelic? Okay, so it's the probability. Again, the second one always goes in the bottom. And then on the top is the overlap. Okay, so that's 0.24 over 0.3. And if I put that into the calculator, I am getting 0.8 or 80%. And that makes sense when I look at the values. A huge proportion of the people who play soccer also play ga uh, Gaelic and soccer. So, um, it would make sense that the answer there is high. Okay, so will you do question five and eight on that page for me, just to see how is your conditional probability and does it make sense? Okay, independent events then. So we've done mutually exclusive, we've done conditional probability, and I suppose independent events is, is I suppose, to me, the last other formula-based uh, section, or the last little section. Okay, so two events, A and B, are said to be independent if the occurrence or non-occurrence of one does not influence the probability of the other occurring e.g. rolling a die and tossing a coin are independent events. The outcome on the die has no influence on the outcome of the coin. In other words, events A and B are independent if the probability of A given B has occurred is the same as the probability of A. Okay. 
go down through the theory of this a little bit. You can read it and then you can look at what I'm doing if you wish. But I want to take you through the formulas for independent events because it can look like there's a load of formulas, but really it's similar. Okay, so how to prove events are independent. Okay, so there's a couple of ways of doing it. So if they're independent, okay, if we think back to rolling a die and tossing a coin, okay, if I was to do these as sets, I would draw a set for rolling a die, I would draw a set for tossing a coin, but they do not overlap. Okay? They're independent. They don't interfere with each other. One doesn't affect the other. You can't have commonality between the two. Okay? Now, if I continue with that thought, then the probability of, in English, rolling a die or tossing a coin is the probability of A intersection B is the probability of the die multiplied by the probability of the coin. Okay, there's no need to over there's no need to subtract anything from that because there is no overlap. Okay? The probability of the two events happening, okay, or probability of rolling a die and tossing a coin is the same as the probability of the events looked at independently. And that is how this proves that they're independent events. Okay, you can also look at it using conditional probability. Okay, so remember what conditional prob probability was. Okay, it was the probability of A occurring given B had occurred was the probability of A intersection B, the overlap over the probability of B having occurred. Okay, well, if there's no overlap, okay, then probability isn't overly conditional. So what you'll find in this case is that that will be the same as the probability of A having occurred independently on its own. Okay, and of course the probability of G B given A has occurred in the same way as the probability of B intersecting with A over the probability of A and you'll find if the probability of B occurring on its own independently it doesn't matter that A has occurred. Okay, so to prove, you just have to show that the probability of A given B has occurred is the same as the probability of A, or the probability of B having occurred given A had happened is the probability of B, or you have to show that the probability of A and B occurring is the probability of A uh, multiplied by the probability of B. Okay, so this is what's called the multiplication rule. So the and is a key word and it will always mean multiply. Okay, so any of these three ways will prove that the events are independent. Why is there three different ways? Well, it just depends on what information they give you in the question as to which one of them makes sense. If they give you loads of information, you can pick whichever one you want. Okay, this one I would say is probably the most frequently used one.
Okay. This is known as multiplication rule for independent events. It is known as the AND rule for independent events. Thus, there are three conditions and any of them can be used for independence. Okay. So, how do they ask it? So, let's have a look at example one. In a group of 30 students, 10 study art, 12 study geography and 4 study both art and geography. Are the events a student studies art and a student studies geography independent? Well, the solution, let, let A represent art, let G represent geography. So the probability of A occurring is those 10 students out of 30. The probability of geography is the 12 students out of 30. And the probability that they study A and G is 4 out of 30. So if you're to choose method 1, you're checking to see is the probability of A multiplied by probability of B equal to the probability of them both happening at the same time. Okay, the probability of A intersecting B. So in other words, the probability of A and G occurring is 1 third or 10 over 30 multiplied by 2 fifths, which is 12 over 30. And we're getting 2 fifteenths of that. That 2 fifteenths there is equal to the 2 fifteenths, which is here, which is the probability of A and G. OK, so because they are equal, the results are independent. OK, so somebody studying art has no bearing on whether they stud study geography. OK, one does not influence the probability of the other occurring. OK, so in, in picking your subjects in this case, they must have been on different streams. OK, they were definitely not against each other. Method two. OK. What you're trying to see here is the probability of A given G has occurred the same as the probability of A on its own. So it's the overlap over the second one, PG. So it's 2 fifteenths over 2 fifths. Put it into calculator and you get a third, which is the probability of A. So because the probability of A given G had occurred is the same as the probability of A, the results are independent. Or you could have done it by method three, and this is because you had so much information in this one. The probability of, of somebody studying geography given that they study art is the probability of geography and art given that um, they study art already. So it's the two fifteenths over the third in this case. Put it into the calculator, it's two fifths. That is equal to them studying geography on their own. So therefore, the results are independent. So just take your time, go down through them, keep looking back here at the three formulas and then see if there's one or way you prefer more than the other. OK, example two. And I want you to take this one down because I'm going to go through it. Events E1 and E2 are such that the probability of E1 given each to E2 has occurred is 0.4. The probability of E2 given E1 has occurred is 0.25 and the probability of E1 intersecting with E2, so the overlap is 0.12. Calculate the probability of E2. And then it asks you are they independent and it says give a reason for your answer. Okay. So let's try this one. Okay. So the probability of E1 given E2 has occurred is 0.4. The probability of E2 given E1 has occurred is 0.25. And then the probability of the overlap is 0.12. So the first part asks me to work out the probability of E2 on its own. OK. So I want a formula that has E2 on the bottom. Uh, the intersection on the top. So if that one is on the bottom, then 
I need E2 to have occurred as such. Okay, because it's always the second one here that goes on the bottom. Okay, let's have these two swap places. The prompt that's just formula manipulation. It's the intersection over given E2 has occurred is uh, the intersection 0.12 over the probability that E1 has occurred is 0.4. Put them into the calculator and I get 0.12 over 0.4 which is 0.3. Okay, if I had been asked for the probability of E1, then I would have chosen the other one. Okay, because the one that comes second is the one that's on the bottom. Okay, so are E1 and E2 independent? This is part two. Well, if so, then the probability of E1, sorry, the, upper, uh, the probability of E2, given E1 has occurred, would be the probability of E2 happening. Okay, why did I pick that particular one? Only because I've just worked out the probability of each E2. So the probability of E2, given the event E1 has occurred, is 0.25. These are not equal, therefore not independent. Okay. Let's do question two in this one. And let's do question eight on this page. So question two, question eight, question 10. Okay. So the multiplication rule then given down the bottom probability of A and B occurring is the probability of A multiplied by the probability of B given A has occurred. Okay, this rule always works. However, if we take into account that A has already occurred when calculating the probability of B, then we can use the following multiplication rules for successive events. In other words, if we know, or if we know the events are independent, we find that the probability of A and B happening is the probability of A multiplied by the probability of B. Okay. Order must be taken into account in this case. Also be careful when the outcome at one stage affects the outcome at the next stage. This rule applies to more than two events. So when the question says, and multiply your probabilities, and from before, when the question says, or, then add the probabilities. Some notes. If we write out all the possible outcomes, calculate the probabilities, and then add the probabilities, the result is always one. We've had that already. Unless told otherwise, always assume non-replacement in an experiment. What do I mean by that? Well, consider the following type of question. A bag contains five white and four black discs. Three discs are removed at random from the bag. Calculate the probability that the three discs are white. Okay, so without replacement means you take out a disc, you then take out a second disc, 
and then you take out the third disc. You're not putting them back into the bag after you take each one out. So that's what it means by without replacement. You're not putting them back into the bag. So each time you take one out, there's one less in the bag. Okay, let's have a look at example two over here to explain this more. A bag contains four red and six blue discs. Two discs are drawn at random one after the other. Find the probability of getting two red discs when the first disc is not replaced, the, sec the, fir the first disc is replaced, and three write out all four outcomes in each case with and without replacement. Show that the probabilities add up to one. Okay, let me, let me do that one for you because it, it deals with a bit of terminology in it. Okay, so the bag contains four red and six blue discs, and we're taking two out at random. Okay, so the first part asks you uh, find the probability okay find the probability of getting two red discs when okay the first part says first disc not replaced Okay, so the way I do probability like this is if I am picking out two discs at random, then I'm going to have two probabilities, two events that I need to work with. So what was the probability of getting the first, what was the probability that the first disc was a red? So we want a red and we want a red disc. So the probability of the first one being red is 6 out of 10 and means multiply. Now it's not replaced so now I only have nine discs in the bag. Okay and I have oh I can't read so I'll scratch that. Sorry now I can't read my own writing so red and red Okay, so that's six blue discs, it's four red discs that's in the bag. Okay, so apologies. So let's go back to that one again. So find the probability of getting two red discs when the first disc is not replaced. So the probability of the first disc being red is four of those ten discs are red in that bag and means multiply and then I've only nine discs left in the bag and only three of them are now um, red. So multiply that out, four threes are 12 over 90, which is two over 15. So that's when the discs are not replaced. Okay, what happens when the first disc is replaced? What does that change? So again, red and red is what I need two probabilities and multiply. Okay, the probability of the first disc being red is still four red discs out of the 10. I then put that back into the bag. So now I'm back up to 10 discs again, but it's a red one I put in. So now there's still four red discs in it. So 16 out of 100, which is four chances out of 25. Okay, and then the third question asked, write out all four outcomes in this case 
with and without replacement show that the probabilities add up to one. So all four outcomes, okay? Well, I could have picked a red disc and a red disc, like we did. I could have picked a red and a blue disc. I could have picked a blue disc and a red disc. Or I could have picked a blue disc and a blue disc. Okay, so this is with re without replacement first. It says with and without, so the probabilities of without replacement, red and red is this 2 over 15 that we've already calculated. Um, so that's outcome 1, outcome 2, outcome 3, outcome 4, okay. A red disc is still 4 out of 10, followed by a blue disc. Well, I'm down to 9 discs in my bag, but 6 of them are blue and if I put that into my calculator I am going to get 24 out of 90 I won't simplify it okay so blue disc first well I have six out of the ten discs are blue and then I'm down to nine discs in the bag four of them being red that's 24 out of 90 again. And then a blue followed by a blue. Well, six of the discs are blue. I'm down to nine discs in the bag and down to five of them being, being blue. So if I add up him and him and him and him, that's four. Yeah, I get my probability being equal to one which is what you should get, okay? And then with replacement, it's the same thing. It's just the probabilities are going to change. So red, red, if it's okay, I'll write it like that. It would be um, what we got above, four out of 25, or we leave it as one hundredths because it'll be easier to see. So let's go red, blue next. So red, the probability of red is 4 over 10 by blue being 6 blues out of the 10. So it's 24 out of 100. Uh, blue red is going to be 6 out of the 10 multiplied by 4 over 10, which is 24 out of 100 again. And then blue blue is going to be 6 over 10 by 6 over 10, which is 36 over 100. And if you add them up, you'll see it totals to 1. Okay, so with and without replacement is important. So look out for that in the questions. Um, when they say they took out two discs drawn at random and they don't specify, it will mean not replaced. Okay. Um, they will say with replacement when it's with replacement. Okay. So let's have a look at example three. A bag contains three red and two yellow discs only. When a disc is drawn from the bag, it is returned before the next draw. So there's replacement here. What is the probability that two draws will yield both discs the same colour? Okay, so there's a couple of ways of doing this. Um, you can use a sample space diagram. You can do it mathematically, which is method two. You can use arrangements or you can use tree diagrams. So I am going to do this one for you and I'm going to do it two of the ways. And you can decide then which way you like. Okay, so a bag contains three red and two yellow. When a disc is drawn, it is returned. 
what is the probability that two draws yield two discs of the same color? Okay. So in this one, if I'm going to just use probability, uh, two discs being the same color means I could have a red and a red or I would be happy with a yellow and a yellow. Okay, so if we work out the probability of red and a red, well I have five discs in total, so I have three chances out of the five of that being a red. I'm then putting it back into the bag, so I have three more chances from those five discs of it being a red. So for that one, sorry, I can't multiply. I am getting three trees are nine over 25 as my probability. Okay, now yellow, yellow. So I have two chances out of five there. This word and means I multiply disc goes back in so I then have two chances out of five again of it being yellow yellow so I have four out of 25. This word or in the middle means I'm going to add these probabilities so my total probability is 13 over 25 and that is my answer. That is the probability of on a two draw disc a two disc draw yielding two discs that are the same colour. Okay, so that's one way of doing it. Like I said, there's four different ways. I'm also going to show you a tree diagram because I want to take the opportunity to show you one. Okay, so this is you out here and you're going to choose a disc. And that first disc you choose could have been a red one. or it could have been a yellow. The probability that it was a red one was three-fifths. There was three out of the five. The probability of it being a yellow one was two-fifths. So that's the start of your tree, where the two branches out of that is your first pick out of the bag. And following on from that, you pick your second one. So your second, so your second one, one, after you pick a red one, one you, could you could then pick another, another red one, one or, you or you could pick a yellow one. Or, or if your first disc is a yellow, yellow one, then on then your second one, you could pick, you could a, pick a red, or you could, or you could pick, pick yellow. yellow. Okay, okay. Now we're putting, now we're putting the discs, discs back in. So the so probability of picking a red one is that disc has gone back in, this red one has come back into the bag. So the probability of picking a red one is three-fifths. Probability of getting yellow, 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 yellow one is two fifths. Two fifths. Down here, here, here my first one is yellow, one yellow, one back into the bag. bag. So the so probability of getting red is three fifths. Three fifths. The probability of getting yellow, yellow, yellow is two, two fifths. Okay. okay. And then you work out the probability of each of your branches. So on this branch, it's red, red, red. One red disc here, here. One red disc here. So I am getting three fifths by three fifths to give me 9 over 25. 25. This, this half, half here, here, red, red yellow, yellow, is, is three fifths, fifths multiplied by, by two, two fifths. fifths. So you just follow you the just probability, probability along, along your, branches. your branches. And I'm getting so six, six twenty fifths, fifths for, that for that one. This one this here is a yellow, yellow followed by a red. By red. So it so is, is two fifths, fifths multiplied by three fifths. fifths. So it's six twenty fifths. And then the bottom is a yellow yellow. So it is two fifths multiplied by two fifths, which is four over twenty five. And if I add them all up, nine and six is fifteen, and six is twenty one, and four is twenty five over twenty five. Okay, so that is the tree diagram. The tree diagram gives me all possible outcomes. I then choose which one are applicable to the question that I was asked. 
So this was two discs the same color. So it was this one and the yellow yellow down the bottom. So red red plus yellow yellow is 9 25ths plus 4 25ths gives me 13 25ths. Okay, so I could have done it that way. So tree diagrams, I like them, they're logical. Um, I will do some exam questions with you on tree diagrams um, because I think they're important and I think you should know how to do them. Okay, and then there's two more examples there. There's example four, example five, which I'm going to leave you to go through yourselves. Example six, example seven, example eight. You can see this is important. This is where we start to um, really get into probability. Okay, and example 10. Okay, um, and if you're struggling with any of those, let me know because I can start the next video at some of those examples. So let me know how they go um, and if you need me to do any of them. Um, for this particular block of exercise, exercise 10.10, .10, I would like you to do question six. Let me just turn the page. Uh, question eight and question 10. Okay, you can see there's any amount of them that you want. I'm just scanning to see is there any of them that requires you to do a tree diagram from... S oh, question 24. Okay, question 24 to me would be important. I'm going to then leave it at that even though there isn't a too much left because I want you to digest that much. I then want to go back and redo any piece that you're struggling with and then I want to go on to Bernoulli trials um, in the next video. Alright, take care.